Good evening, Erev Tov, and good day to all our friends wherever you are. My name is Ruby Shamir, and I'm the Executive Director of AIFL, America-Israel Friendship League in Israel. I'm happy to host you again on this webinar, which is focusing on vir virtual gallery tour in New York City. The AFL is hosting webinars on different topics twice a week. We actually have hosted so far since COVID started over 150 webinars, and I'm happy to be here again. I would like to introduce to you today's guide, Gabriela. Gabriela Weinstecher was born in Buenos Aires, raised in Tel Aviv, and has lived and worked in New York City since 2004. She's an artist who makes porcelain sculptures, videos, photographs, and drawings, and she's currently preparing a large installation for a show at the Bronx Museum, which will be opening on November 10th. Gabriela has taught art at Williams College and Hunter College, and since 2014, she has been giving lectures and leading tours about contemporary art in New York, where I met her. I met Gabriela actually at one of her tours when she started, and since then, enjoy viewing art with her, modern art actually, with her since then. Today, Gabriela will guide us through some New York best contemporary art galleries in Chelsea and the Lower East Side. While revisiting cherished work of artists like Oldenburg and Van Bruggen, we'll also look at works of Katsu, a new media artist who has roots in graffiti. We will see a piece of art from Amy uh, Silman as well, from her show Twice Removed. Before I let Gabriela start, I would like to introduce our moderator, which most of you probably already know, our executive director, Wayne Firestone, executive director of AIFL in the US. Enjoy, these are great exhibits, please. Thanks, Ruby. It is so great to be in one of our art segments. And I always know the biggest smile on Ruby's face is when we get to visit, whether it's in Tel Aviv or in New York or in a gallery, pretty much anywhere. Uh, art inspires. This is uh, one, of, one of, I would say, the discoveries we've seen during COVID is that art and artists matter even more now than ever. And uh, when we did our first episode with Gabriella, uh, uh, we knew there would be more. The response from the audience was tremendous. Uh, people living in our little caves, whether at home or in an office or a remote place or even traveling, uh, need to connect. And art is our way to connect. And we've really uh, found that the contemporary art scene in Israel and in uh, uh, New York and other parts of the United States is one of those bridging points. It is a connection point in which we can talk to each other and be excited together and learn about uh, some uh, approaches and perspectives and even uh, technologies that are new uh, that artists are discovering and, and, and playing with and that that's going to improve our lives. So before um, I uh, let Gabriella take it away with three amazing new segments uh, to share with you, from different parts of New York, I, I want to turn to the audience for a moment, recognizing each of us in our own ways has sort of uh, la'at la'at, we've sort of come out of our caves, we've maybe visited an outdoor sculpture garden, we've maybe entered into somebody's home uh, for the first time and seen uh, a, a piece of artwork uh, uh, that's new to us, um, uh, that has uh, arrived by Amazon. Um, I'd love to hear uh, or see in the chat, invite everyone uh, to name an artist or a gallery or an exhibit or something that anyone has uh, uh, seen uh, during this uh, last few months that was either inspiring to you or in some way surprising. In other words, it surprised you that uh, uh, something that, that you hadn't quite expected, because I think that's one of the things 
that we know about the uh, contemporary art scene is that sometimes it's going to take you to a different place. Uh, someone's been to the Van Gogh immersion, which I, I see lots of ads for, and I know here in the DC area, uh, one of the ways in which we can sort of view art in a different way with a group of, of, of people is certainly one of uh, the, the developments. I, I guess it's, it's, it's been happening over time, but one of the things that uh, I guess COVID uh, disrupted but didn't completely uh, uh, eliminate. Uh, so as we're uh, meeting these new artists today that Gabriella is going to introduce us to, if you have recommendations or if you have inspirations of, of other artworks and pieces you want to share with people, please put it in the chat. And as always, we'll be monitoring your, your questions throughout and want to make sure there's an opportunity for, for everyone to ask different questions to Gabriella, Gabriella over the course of our webinar today. So Gabriella, tell us a little bit about uh, uh, your, your, your choices today and we can probably just jump right in with something that for some may be a little shocking or surprising, uh, uh, but we hope we'll sort of jumpstart our conversation today. Oh, that was a great introduction, Wayne. Thank you so much. Um, and thanks, Ruby, uh, for hosting me, inviting me again uh, to take you on an art tour. Um, yeah, I love that what you said about that moment of seeing art in the flesh again after, after so much time at home, seeing new art beyond what's on our own walls, those of us who are fortunate enough to have art on our walls at home. Um, one of the biggest perks of being an artist is that even though we don't necessarily have a lot of money, we can amass pretty good art collections uh, by trading with our friends. And I've been doing that throughout the pandemic. I've been um, trading artworks with friends of mine from all over the world, really. And I've um, expanded my art collection at home, which I'm really excited about. Um, so yeah, I want to tell you a little bit about um, about what I chose to show you today. I'm sure some of you uh, came to my previous um, art tour, virtual art tour, and some of you are new, um, uh, both as uh, an educator, a professor, a lecturer, uh, an art critic, a curator. I really define myself as someone who is inspired as, and is kind of an expert at uh, introducing art to the non-art world people. Uh, I don't like the whole dialogue of speaking to the choir, the inside uh, jargony conversations that we can have uh, in the art world sometimes. I love talking about art with a fresh uh, perspective that also talks about how, it is, how is art relevant to our lives, not just us artists, us curators, the worlds that I uh, walk in, but also like Wayne said, um, how is art and how are artists relevant uh, maybe today more than ever, maybe today just as much as, as ever. Um, and that was kind of the guiding principle in uh, choosing the three exhibitions um, that I brought for you today. One is we're gonna start with a show by um, a Japanese artist who lives in New York named Katsu, uh, which means schnitzel. Uh, I'll talk about the, his name soon. Um, this is a pre-pandemic show. Then we're going to see, uh, we're also going to see a show that was supposed to open during the pandemic, had to be postponed and opened a little later in the pandemic that includes both work that was made before and work that was made after. Uh, and another show that was just a few months ago from a classic, uh, Klaus Oldenburg and Kushe van Bruggen to kind of connect us to art history and how it still matters today. So all those things were one of the questions that is always leading me is how is art relevant for us today? And what does this art have to give me as a person, not just as an artist? Um, so I wanna jump right in. And uh, before I do, I wanna say, I love the chat. I love the questions. If you have any questions, any thoughts, please put them in. Wayne will be monitoring this because I, I can't really divide my attention, but Wayne, please feel free to jump in with relevant questions if they feel pertinent in the moment, I, I'm happy to answer them. And I'll also leave a little bit of time at the end to answer questions um, that you think are more appropriate to ask at the end. Okay, so here is my screen. So we're starting from um, 
uh, a show in a gallery in the Lower East Side. We're going to see some shows from Chelsea and some shows from the Lower East Side. Those are two of New York City's biggest and most important art neighborhoods, gallery neighborhoods. There are more of them, but uh, those are really the, um, the big ones. And this is from a gallery I love uh, called The Hole, uh, which is in the Lower East Side. Now they're also opening a, um, a space in Tribeca. This is the pre-pandemic show that I had to show you um, by Katsu. The name of the show is Dot. So that is the text that you're seeing there written on the wall. And uh, yes, what you are seeing is a gallery wall that has some canvases on it, but then the painting action is happening all over the place. Uh, they're huge spray marks, and we'll soon talk about exactly how these spray marks were made, that are evenly distributed pretty much between the walls and the canvas. The canvases are almost there um, randomly. And before we jump into the show, I want to tell you a little bit about who Katsu is. So this is a, a one a one name man like uh, Madonna. It's not his real name. We do not know his real name. This is his, uh, you know, some people say nom de plume. This is his nom de spray. He is a graffiti artist. Um, and he doesn't show his name because what he does is often illegal. And he's not just a graffiti artist. He is kind of um, a technological innovator in the world of graffiti. Uh, so for example, this is a Calvin Klein uh, billboard on Broadway that he defaced a few years back. And you may ask yourself, how did he get so far up there? Did he uh, splunk from the, from the roof? Did he climb up there? Is he Spider-Man? You can see these uh, little marks. The way he made these marks is with drones. So he worked not just by himself, he collaborated in an open source setting. So over the internet, working in an open source way, which means that people share their progress and their uh, software with each other. Uh, he developed uh, a drone that you can control from far away with a spray can on it that allowed him to control this uh, drone from wherever he was at the moment and uh, the faceless Calvin Klein um, uh, banner. Uh, and we will uh, come back to this drone technology soon. Another innovation I wanted to show you, now uh, I need to prepare you, I'm gonna show you a video from 2011. So this video is not very high quality, it's not HD, but here is um, Katsu tagging outside of LA Mocha. He's writing his name and you can see it's pretty big what he's writing with, what he's, what he's managing to write. And that's because he's not using a spray bottle to write his name Katsu. He is using a fire extinguisher. So he took a fire extinguisher. He is a pioneer in this as well, filled it up with paint and made it into a giant powerful spray bottle, which allows him to um, tag the whole side of LA Mocha. And this was a little bit in protest uh, to the show Art in the Streets where LA Mocha brought in um, artists like uh, um, Keith Haring and Basquiat and made a show of artists inspired by graffiti who were also graffiti um, artists in the show. And Katsu, who was not included in the show, uh, chose this way to make his mark. So this just to say, and here is the one picture of Katsu that I could find for you. He's the guy here um, in, the, in the hazmat suit uh, next to one of his pieces. This is just to show how really his art, which is shown in galleries and shown um, and sold in galleries and art fairs all over the world has its like legitimate legal side and also its illegal um, subversive side. No, the whole is uh, one of the galleries that represents his work in, um, in New York. And when they invited him to do uh, the show, which he called Dot, he took that, um, that drone technology that I told you about uh, one step further. And I wanted to bring you another little video that shows how he made um, this particular show. So this, was, uh, this video was produced by the gallery. And I'm just gonna uh, talk over it a little bit. So you can see another one of his drones with the spray can attached to it. And 
basically the innovation, the kind of progress he made for, um, for this show was that the drone now was working with an algorithm that told it randomly where to put the dots in the room. So the room is mapped out three-dimensionally for the drone and then the, the algorithm picks randomly where the dots are gonna go, which is why some of them went on the canvases and some of them went on the walls and dripped down to the floor. And then there's another algorithm that then after the drone marked the little spots in black, told it which colors to then paint um, those, uh, those marks with. So first there were little dots in a kind of a silvery black. And then on top of that was the selection of colors. So every single choice, artistic choice in this show was made randomly by an algorithm and executed by a machine. The artist's role here was to set up the system that would create the artwork. Let's look at a few more uh, detail shots. Uh, you can see the floor, all the edges of the floor by the wall were covered in paint that kind of dripped down from the markings. Um, so the paintings were sold um, during the show and after the show, but the installation, all the, you know, all the color of the wall, the, the color on the floor, that was all just erased at the end of the show. So it's both a painting show, kind of a performance documentation, if we can think of what the drone did as a performance, uh, and a site-specific installation that was then erased after the show was over. And I guess one of the questions, um, oh, and here's another room where they left one wall uh, empty and just brought one of the paintings on it, just so we can see how the paintings work when they're on a, on a blank wall. So of course, one of the, um, one of the questions that a show like this uh, raises is, well, who made this work? Did the artist really make the work or is the drone the artist? Um, and is this really art if the painter, if the artist didn't choose the colors, didn't choose their location, and um, didn't even make the marks? Of course, he is not the first artist who, um, who is asking uh, these questions. Uh, the fact that he's using uh, dots of color and calling the show dots is a very clear reference to the work of Damien Hirst. Here is one of Damien Hirst's paintings. Uh, Damien Hirst is a world. Um, world famous uh, painter who is partially also famous for the fact that he, he does not paint any of his paintings. His assistants paint his paintings. He sometimes decides on the color and the distance of the dots, but then they do all the painting for him. Um, and a lot of other artists throughout art history have used, um, have used machines, have used assistance, have used chance and randomness to make their work. And I think this is a question the artists love to ask. What happens if you remove from the equation the genius of the artist? What happens if you remove from the equation the painting hand of the artist? What is left? Um, is the fact that I can make beautiful and aesthetic, decorative, colorful, uh, work using these machines and these random algorithms, does that make it less of an artwork? Does that make it less of an, ex an aesthetic experience? These are the questions that um, Katsu is asking. And of course, as a graffiti artist, he's really interested in subversion, right? He's really interested in doing the thing that is not allowed, the thing that is frowned upon, the thing that doesn't count as art. Um, this is from a different show that he had with uh, one of his galleries in London, uh, a, a, a show of flower paintings. And of course, this is a very strong Andy Warhol uh, reference, uh, both when he's doing the grid in different colors and using the same image over and over again. Uh, so um, Katsu didn't paint Marilyn Monroe, but he paints these other um, portraits, these drippy uh, graffitied portraits. And when I say he paints them, of course, he does not paint them himself. I brought you uh, another short video um, from, the, um, from the studio. This is from Katsu's Instagram page of um, this sitting robot that paints the paintings uh, for Katsu. So this uh, painting is called Blondie and we'll soon see why. Here's the, the blonde goes on. 
Um, so, and he's very forthcoming uh, in sharing his techniques and sharing videos and, and images from the studio in how he, in how he makes the work. Um, so we've talked about him as a graffiti artist. We've talked about him as a painter who uh, subverts questions of authority and of artistic genius, um, who shows us the, the random process in which he makes his work. And the last thing I wanna show you is a piece that's, um, that's even older that you can find if you search for uh, katsu um, on YouTube. And katsu, by the way, means um, breaded chicken, uh, like schnitzel, uh, the Japanese version. So I, if you Google him, you have to say katsu artist or katsu painter or katsu graffiti. Otherwise you'll just get a lot of pictures of schnitzel. Um, and here is one last video I wanna show you. So um, this is a very shocking video of uh, Katsu allegedly defacing a Picasso at MoMA. Uh, the video, if you saw, starts with the logo of MoMA and Picasso's signature. All of these are kind of lifted from the internet by Katsu. The video itself is a complete digital fabrication. Katsu was never at the MoMA and he never tagged a Picasso. You would have heard about it even in 2010. Um, the whole thing was um, a fabrication. So it's a video, digital video piece where he superimposed himself onto a video of, um, of a room at MoMA and he added that uh, sound of the guard yelling at him, excuse me, sir. And it's very funny to me to think that um, all that would happen to you if you tagged uh, a Picasso at MoMA is that a guard would yell at you, excuse me, sir. I'd like to imagine that MoMA has some sort of SWAT team that would jump on you if you did something like that. Um, so this is Katsu at the hall. And I'm seeing that there are a few. Um... Yeah, Gabriella, uh, 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 first of all, great choice on a provocative first uh, uh, artist to start yeah. with. And I love the idea that we've taught people how to say schnitzel in Japanese at a, <laughs> a, at a bare minimum. Um, I don't want to go down the rabbit hole of the many questions we've already had. We'll save it for the end as it relates to the drone technology and some of the uh, questions that, that you thoughtfully posed as part of thinking about this kind of graffiti work. But mm -hmm. there was an early question from Deborah about Katsu himself, which we may not know because of his anonymous status, but is a question that I think is probably raised uh, with other, uh, 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 some famous graffiti artists. Are they actually trained in art? Do they have art training um, in addition to their uh, provocative, uh, uh, you know, approaches to art, do you know anything about that at all? Uh, for about him, I don't. I don't know for him. I don't know for him. But um, because again, he's anonymous, and I only know his work as it as it became available. You know, when he became known in the art world. So I don't know if he went to art school. But um, the in general, uh, graffiti artists are often self taught. And uh, they don't necessarily go to art school, but they often take, you know, they often learn how to draw and how to design, how to do color work, both working in the field on the streets, um, working in their sketchbooks. Every graffiti artist I've ever talked to has a prolific sketchbook practice where they draw and paint and uh, plan out their work um, in sketchbooks before they go in the middle of the night to, to do them. So in a way, a lot of graffiti artists are self-taught. Um, self and give themselves kind of put themselves through their own art school. Um, but then of course, some, some go to art school, some, as you see, some artists who, um, who are active in the art world are also graffiti artists for fun. Um, so it really, really varies. Okay, let's go to the next segment. All right. So uh, yeah, and I'm happy to answer um, any other questions uh, at the end for sure. So the next show I want to show you is really uh, going back a few decades um, and revisiting uh, a little bit lesser known work from uh, a very well, very well known artist or a, a team of artists. 
And uh, this is from a show that opened at Pace a few months ago. Pace is one of the biggest galleries in the world. They have a giant now whole building of galleries in, on 25th Street in Chelsea. Um, and this is uh, Klaus Oldenburg and Kusha van Bruggen, um, a project of theirs from 85. Uh, before we jump into the show, I want to give a quick kind of reminder of who um, uh, Oldenburg and Van Bruggen are. Klaus Oldenburg is kind of the more brand name among the two. This is not a coincidence. Often in art history and still today, teams of artists where one is male and the other one is female, even if they have equal parts in the collaboration, are often only known for the male artist's name for various obvious cultural reasons. Um, but um, uh, Klaus Oldenburg did start on his own. He was, um, he is uh, still alive and he is one of the kind of original pop artists that came up in the 60s with, um, uh, with Andy Warhol and, uh, and um, all that other generation. And he was not, he was never a painter, he's a sculptor. And he became known for, you know, pop artists had this preoccupation with everyday objects and often painted them. So that's, you know, Andy Warhol's soup cans and Coke bottles, etc. cetera. Uh, Klaus Oldenburg did that in sculpture and he called them soft sculpture. This is his soft toilet from 66. It's made out of vinyl material that he hand stitched himself. He did a lot of food as well, uh, fast food mostly, the bag of fries. This is my favorite picture of Oldenburg carrying one of his massive um, uh, paint tubes. So he also, kind of did the ephemera of the studio as enlarged works. And so at this point of his career in the 60s, he's, um, he's very well known. He's uh, starting to show. He had a, he had a studio in a gallery in, um, in Soho, and he was showing uh, where all the other pop artists uh, were showing at the time. And he was making a lot of food. These are all stitched. Um, uh, sculptures, stuffed and stitched, club sandwiches. So that, that is the work. So he's making these kind of larger, but not huge sculptures of everyday objects, a lot of food, um, and he's stitching them. And then he meets Kusha van Bruggen. Kusha van Bruggen at that time is an up and coming curator. She uh, was about 20 years younger than him. Uh, she actually died in the 90s from cancer. So she died quite young. Um, and um, uh, they not only start working together on museum exhibitions in the Netherlands where she was working, but they also kind of start working together. So it starts as this collaboration between curator and artist that's strictly professional and then friendly where he's making work and she's writing about it and then they're kind of talking about it and then he's coming to her before the work is even done and they're talking about it and then she starts making some suggestions and before you know it these two alchemies happen between these two people one is that they become a couple so they're not just collaborators they're not just people who inspire each other and who are working together professionally, but they fall in love and stay together until the end of Van Bruggen's life. And they also start making art together. And the thing, the big thing that Van Bruggen brings to this collaboration is she says, let's go big. And then they start making giant sculptures. This is from the, uh, this is in the collection of the Israel Museum, the Apple Core. Um, they move away from the materials that um, Oldenburg was using before, the soft hand stitch materials, and start fabricating enormous artworks. This is the shuttlecock in the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art in Kansas City, um, where suddenly this sense of humor that was in the, in the artwork before is transformed into something still with a lot of sense of humor, but something monumental. This is one of my favorite uh, pieces of theirs um, at the Walker Art Center, which is a very, very well-known museum in Minneapolis that has not just really interesting uh, changing exhibitions, but an excellent sculpture garden outside. And the uh, Spoon and Cherry, Spoon Bridge and Cherry piece is also a fountain, which not a lot of people know. You can kind of see the water spraying here from the top of the, of the cherry. 
So she took what he was already doing and made it huge and made it theatrical in a way that it wasn't before and made it participatory in a way that it wasn't before. So um, before the show that we're going to see opened, um, they had a solo show in one of the other uh, Pace galleries where there was kind of a retrospective of a lot of their um, maquettes and the, the models and the drawings that they made in preparation for the work. Here's Oldenburg um, in the show. And the one huge piece that was in the show was this dropped flower bouquet. And this is the last piece that they collaborated uh, on before Van Bruggen passed away. It had never been fabricated. It only existed as an idea in a small model. And the first time it had ever been fabricated was for this show. And this is um, Oldenburg posing uh, with it. So all of this, just to, um, just to show who they are in general, to give people an idea of what they, of what they made, and also to give a little bit of a preface to um, this project that we're gonna see. This is one of the reasons I love uh, living in New York and being able to see uh, shows in New York because every once in a while, I see a show that I know, this is not a show that then I'm gonna see in a million galleries and a million museums all over the world. You know, Some shows kind of go on tour, you see them at MoMA and then you see them at this museum in DC and then you'd see them this museum in Paris, this museum in London, you know you're gonna see these shows again. This is a project that I know I will not see again um, that uh, you know, premiered when I was a toddler. Uh, so it was such a, such a privilege to be able to see even little bits of this project, uh, which is called Il Corso del Coltello, the course of the knife, the path or the root of the knife. And uh, you see it here installed um, with the beautiful Manhattan skyline behind it. You can kind of see through the shades of the gallery. And as I said, this is a collaborative project that um, came to life in 1985. And it all starts in an art class that Oldenburg, Van Bruggen, and Frank Gehry, the architect, teach together. They co-teach it in, uh, in Italy. And what they do when they start the project, they, um, they you know, they're, very, they're inspired by everyday objects as uh, pop artists. Uh, Frank Gehry is inspired, if you know uh, Frank Gehry's uh, buildings, his shapes, uh, he's inspired by things that fold open and close. And so they bring an object, a Swiss army knife to class. And they tell the students, we are gonna make a project together. It's gonna be shown in Venice at the Venice Biennial. And it's all gonna start from this Swiss army knife. Let's start playing. They don't start with an idea. They don't start with a concept. They don't know what's gonna happen. The, all they know is they have this Swiss army knife. And this is one of the original drawings kind of and excuse the bad picture, this is just a picture I snapped with my phone. Um, I have not found it in a catalog anywhere. I've just started to think, oh, how can a Swiss Army knife look? Maybe it looks like a little bug or a little animal. Maybe it looks like a boat, a sailboat. Let's start playing. And this project ended up becoming a performance. As you can see, there's some photographic documentation an installation, a series of sculptures, drawings, uh, paintings. It became a project in which the students and the teachers, which we will see, kind of did a procession throughout the streets of Venice in which these sculptures that were made to look like crates, suitcases, things that you take on a trip were packed, hauled onto a boat and sailed away with great fanfare. The exhibition includes both these objects and little treasures on top of them. Here is the hat that Frank Gehry wore in his, um, in his performance. So it was a hat and a, a wearable sculpture. Look at the way the gallery chose to present the photographic documentation. You know, instead of doing some sort of dry slideshow or have a book where you can look, they printed out some of the best photos documenting what the show looked like and stacked them up uh, one on top of each other in a way that is very architectural, right? So also is very kind of uh, reminiscent of, um, of Frank Gehry's uh, work. And I have to show you, this is the favorite picture that I found, uh, my favorite picture I found in my 
uh, research of the show. And here is Frank Gehry in costume in the middle of the performance dressed as a, um, a Greek temple. And it's really funny to think of that and then to think of uh, Gary's own architecture. This is the building he has in Chelsea, by the way, for those of you who are not local. Um, this is the, um, the office building that he has there. But this is him uh, in, the, in the performance. He used the slide projector. He's, uh, I don't know what the monologue was, but he had a monologue that he said. He cuts through a maquette as part, of the, as part of the exhibition. And in the exhibition, we don't just see the documentation of what he wore and what he looked like, but we also see the costume itself. But look how they chose to show the costume. So kind of a more traditional, if you rethink of the Costume Institute, for example, in the, at the Med or other um, museums that show costumes, they always use um, mannequins to show costumes, which I have to say, personal note, I hate <laughs> uh, mannequins as pedestals. So I think this is such an interesting choice made by the gallery and, uh, and the artists together to take this um, outfit, this wearable sculpture that was worn like this, and show it all crumpled up. But in a way, it almost, it looks itself like a figure uh, sitting. So I just love the way they, um, they show that. And then they also show right next to it, another sculpture, which is much larger now. You can see the scale. This is not uh, really pants that anyone wore, but another sculpture that was made as part of this uh, show to kind of see the, show the train of thought, right? We start, at, we start designing a, um, a costume, and then it turns into its own sculpture, into its own thing. There's a lot of moments in the show. Here are some details just to show the stitching, the hand dyeing of the, of the fabric. There's a lot of examples in the show of an idea being transformed from a two-dimensional concept to a three-dimensional object. Um, I'm gonna show you another one of those. So this is a drawing, right here, here it is uh, framed. This is a drawing that was part of that inspiration in the same kind of burst that when they made the drawings of the Swiss army knife, a drawing that shows this kind of jacket. And here is the actual jacket in the show that, um, that someone wore. The um, sculptures themselves that all spell out coltello, the knife, uh, act as um, their own pedestals on which um, drawings and paintings lie. And now here we see how they came up with the Frank Gehry uh, costume. So just a in really interesting project, but also a really interesting way to show the artwork in the space, which I really, really appreciated. Um, seeing a, a very um, original way to show photo, to show drawing, to show objects, to show clothing. Here is uh, one of the pieces being pushed up the ramp and here it is in the show with a little walking stick and bag. This is, uh, this is the uh, costume that Oldenburg himself um, uh, wore. He is dressed up as a Swiss army knife. So that's his, uh, that, that was the cap with a very long, um, hood. And we talked about the Swiss army knife in the beginning, but we haven't really gotten to where it ended up in the show. So here is, um, here's a Swiss army knife again, and we see it, it's slightly enlarged, right? So we can see uh, everyday objects being enlarged a little bit, very pop art, very reminiscent of Oldenburg's uh, previous work. At this point where he's making this work, it looks like the work he made 20 years ago from, uh, from the 80s to the 60s. But when we look closer at that, we see this is called knife ship and scale one to 12. This is a scale model. So what they did in collaboration with Frank Gehry is they took a Swiss army knife and turned it into a workable boat. That was a whole other project called El Cuchillo Barco. It then, this actually went on tour and was shown in a lot of different museums 
uh, both its kind of maiden voyage was in Venice where it sailed off an actual Swiss army knife boat. And here in New York, we got to see it in 95 at the Guggenheim, a show that was completely devoted to the knife ship and the Corso del Coltello project where it docked on the lower level of the Guggenheim Museum. And just a few more pictures. Um, that I wanna show you of the work. One of the things I love about visiting uh, Pace Gallery is really the view that you can see, you can kind of peek at the view of, uh, of New York um, from the many windows that the galleries have. And then you can take the elevator to the, um, to the they have a sculpture garden in the middle of the building where you can come outside and see uh, sculpture, a rotating exhibition of sculptures by the um, gallery artists and see them juxtaposed with the Manhattan skyline. This is a calder, this is a two calder pieces that were installed at the moment, now it's something else. Um, but I just love seeing the art kind of talk to the, to the skyline. So this is uh, Oldenburg and Van Bruggen at Pace Gallery, Il Corso del Coltello from 1985. Um, so Wayne, unless um, you have some well, questions. Gabrielle, I just have up. to say, uh, you know, you are uh, soft sculpture and uh, your explanation of it in touring is getting a lot of love from people all over, uh, some of whom are seeing uh, uh, these images for the very first time. Again, we'll try to come back to some of the specifics. If I could just distill a couple of the comments and, 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 and questions yeah. uh, about collaboration. I mean, you've, I, I mean, it's fascinating to see Gary there in a costume and then to look at uh, that displayed, as you said, without a mannequin and yeah. on its own. Do these kind of collaborations, uh, uh, we'll leave the romantic piece to the side for the moment, but just the, artists coming together, different disciplines, different perspectives, and, and, and something emerged from that, which you simply couldn't have imagined with, without those forces coming together. Is that, mm -hmm. is that something that, that uh, uh, only certain types of artists are open to, or you see uh, uh, you know, more, more of that in the contemporary art scene? Uh, well, you see a lot of it. Um, collaboration has always been a thing and um, always been, I think, a really interesting thing when it works out. Um, what artists are open to it? That's a great question. Um, a lot of artists that you meet, especially studio artists, when I'm thinking of painters, sculptors, um, people who make work in the studio are not really team players, <laughs> if I can put it that way, you know, like, a lot of people work with assistants, but that's not the same as collaborating. They do what you tell them to do. Um, but studio artists are often kind of, they, they're visionaries. They don't want anyone to touch what they do. They're, the hand of the artist is very important to them, you know, unless they're katsu. Um, so finding a collaboration that really works, that is not, um, that is really something new that could have never happened in the practice of either one of the collaborators is, is not very common and is really wonderful when it happens. Uh, people like architects, composers, directors, theater artists, these are people who are used to working in a team. So, you know, in the world of theater, you see a lot, of a lot more collaboration often. Um, people coming together, they're used to working together. But even Frank Gehry is like a total visionary and his work is so unmistakably his that I thought it was fascinating to see him kind of totally give himself up to, um, to this collaboration. And it wasn't just a cameo. No, no, you can see how much of his, how much of his um, identity he brought. And he, he taught this class with them. He worked with the students with them. Yeah. That's awesome. Again, lots of questions, but Amy Stillman, we, we've got to give her her full due. So yes. let's, let's make sure we get the, the full segment in and then we'll, we'll, oh, we'll yeah, try yeah. in the back we end have, we a have couple time. of questions. We have time. Yeah, so um, Amy Stillman, I wanted to bring this show. This show uh, happened uh, exactly one year ago, but you know how time moves in the pandemic. I feel like it slows, it slows down, then it speeds up. 
this show really speaks to me right now. Um, I love the show. I keep revisiting images from it and I wanted to share it with you. So it's called Twice Removed. It was uh, shown at Gladstone Gallery in Chelsea. And I just wanted to start from this installation view of the show because this is really a very Silman way of showing her work. She puts her work together in a, in a strip. A lot of her work on paper is often showed unframed, which then when collectors buy it, they always frame it because this is a very non-archival way to show uh, drawings and you wouldn't want to hang it in your living room like this. So it's really the only opportunity you get to see someone's work displayed the way she wants it to be displayed and prefers it to be displayed. Here she is in her studio and we're going to meet her in one moment. I brought you a little video um, of her talking about her work. But um, the special thing about this show is that it was scheduled for um, April, May 2020. And of course, in April, May 2020, there was nothing because New York was shut down and dealing with a really uh, life or death crisis of uh, the COVID pandemic. And the show got pushed back indefinitely at the moment and it ended up being shown in October, November of the same year. And um, what we ended up seeing in the show is both work that was done before the pandemic, so it was ready for the show when the pandemic started, and work that was made in that interim time between the time that the show was supposed to open and when it actually did. So very much inspired and um, made by the conditions that Silman had in the pandemic. So before we start, I wanna, um, I wanna share with you a little video. This is two minutes with um, Amy Silman talking about her work and then we'll keep going. My whole infant this in making art, making work, writing, drawing, is to function as a kind of combination brickler, flanner, voyeur, radish farmer, auto mechanic, and take parts and with my labor, remake a strange new language. I'm Amy Silman. I'm a painter. I live in New York. I write. I make cartoons. I make animations. I make things that are sort of free floating from instinct, from urge, off the cuff. Following a train of thought and working in a kind of body or family of relations, I work from information and feelings and thoughts that I have that have carried over from a work that I've done before. But since that's kind of an endless chain, I would say there's no origin. There's no moment of starting. Everything is a kind of loop. I work really hard all the time. I just go over and over and over things. I think it's a little neurotic. Um, I know it is, but this process of covering and covering and covering seems to be a kind of will toward continuity and attachment and fragmentation at the exact same time. I work in and out of humor, in and out of narrative, in and out of figuration, form, abstraction. And then what I really love the most is when these forms and these fragments come together inside of a room or a space, something like a gallery or a museum space. And in the moment of installation, I put them together. And in doing so, it's basically like cobbling together a kind of grammar or rhetoric. So I just wanted you to hear what A.B. Sullivan sounds like, uh, what her studio looks like before I dive into the show. As you can probably tell, she is extremely eloquent and speaks beautifully about her work. She's not just a painter, but she is a painting professor, a very beloved and kind of reverently followed um, art professor. She teaches at Bard in upstate New York and other um, painting programs. And um, I want to talk a little bit about this theme that keeps coming back when she explains her work, which is the theme of the narrative, the endless chain, the train of thought. She uses a lot of words to describe this thing that is also very, very um, vivid in the way she installs her work, which is the sequence. The sequence that is at once both kind of a narrative, kind of a story unfolding from one 
picture to the next, but also very loose, very abstract, kind of the opposite of a narrative, really like a train of thought, really like a chain of associations. And I want to take one little moment in the show, which is this corner of purple and black paintings. So let's look at them. It's not like we can really say what's painted inside of them. They're almost figures. There's almost like a horse head there. But what we're really seeing is this language that kind of teeters between drawing and painting, between figuration and abstraction. That is to say, between something that we can recognize and something that is unrecognizable, figuration and abstraction, and how she moves from one to the other. So as, as pieces, they are also kind of complete pieces, really something between painting and drawing. She leaves a lot of raw paper and raw canvas also when she paints. But also the same kind of colors, the same kind of shapes and how they evolve from one to the other. And when you see them together, they really become something a little bit more than the sum of their parts, almost like a narrative. By the way, there was a moment in the video where you saw kind of images changing and overlaid one on top of the other. She makes animations out of her paintings and drawings as well. So she makes paintings and drawings. Here's her studio, giant paintings. You can see how she works on everything together as well. But she also makes zines that you can, uh, you can buy her zines for a few dollars, whereas her paintings cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, and she writes beautifully and eloquently, and she also makes animations. So what happened in the show was that she was all ready to go. The show was ready. A lot of these kind of abstracty, um, drawing, painting-y uh, works that we know very well. And then the pandemic hit. And not only was her show now postponed indefinitely, and who knows what's going to happen, she lost access to her studio because her studio is at the art school where she teaches and she, it was lock, on lockdown. She couldn't leave the house. So she goes from painting you know, these big paintings in her studio and she's stuck at home. And what she starts painting at home are flowers. So you can see this tiny little painting. Here it is. She starts painting what she can at home with watercolors, with little papers of all the blooms that she had in her garden and in her vase at home. And she says, she writes about this, that she both find it, finds it very comforting because of the beauty and the, and the life that the flowers have. But she also finds it a really good place to, of release for her anxiety because she says, flowers are also funerary. They also, they are life, right? They are the reproductive organs of plants, but they're also what we put on graves and what we bring to funerals. And that moment between life and death was very poignant in that moment, of course, for all of us and for her as well. And when she eventually opens the show, she made with her gallery the very interesting move of putting those together. You would think in the art world, we have this thing, especially in the States, especially in New York, where artists are supposed to be consistent. We like to know what we're going to get from an artist, especially art dealers, galleries, whose business it is to sell art. You would think that Amy Selman is not supposed to show paintings of flowers because she is this very sophisticated, abstract painter. But then when she brings her flowers, look at this narrative that she constructs here from this giant abstract piece in the middle and then going down in size to the other paintings. Let's look at them uh, together. So we can suddenly see how, look at the palette of these paintings, this kind of gold and purple. And then it moves on to the next painting where we see the same gold and purple, but now they're activating these kind of chunky uh, abstract forms. And then this largest painting next to them, which to me is really kind of a marriage of the flowers and the very abstract piece. We can almost recognize the stem and the flower up here. So she really made you know, lemonade out of what happened. And she managed to bring this moment of not only despair and fear and anxiety, but like also doing something that's so the opposite of what she's used to doing in the studio. And instead of censoring it, putting it aside, saying these are paintings for the drawer that I just made to comfort myself, showing them and saying, look, this is related. These abstract paintings and the paintings of the flowers, I find a connection between them. 
And she especially talked, this is the last thing I'll say about this show before I open it up to your questions. She talked about looking at the paintings of flowers and vases and uh, finding some of the most interesting moments in the water of the vase. So look at the moment where the stem of the flowers go into the vases. We're gonna zoom in a little bit. And she said, that's the moment, anyone who's ever put like some flowers into a glass clear vase knows that suddenly they get a little bigger and a little fuzzy, right? Once they go in the water and there's a disconnect between the actual stem and the way it looks like when it's in the water. She found so much interesting elements there as an abstract painter. And here's the other one. This really looks like some of her abstract paintings that she immediately saw the connection between these um, flowers and the abstract painting in that moment of the water, the stem and the vase of the water. Um, so I really found this show super inspiring uh, because of how she, how she dealt really with this, um, the unknowing, the way I think a lot of us are feeling, I don't wanna say we're in the post pandemic moment, but we are in, the, in a different moment of the pandemic than we were in the beginning. I think a lot of us are feeling how the pandemic has changed us has changed the way we see our life, the way we see our work, the way we see our relationships. And she really used that knowledge to grow as a painter rather than let it um, stop her or stifle her. Well, um, so yeah, that's Amy Selman at Gladstone Gallery. And uh, I'm very happy to answer questions. Yeah, let me just put in a, a, a quick reaction from uh, one of uh, the viewers. Jerry says that Amy's paintings, when you look at them together, remind me of a series of cartoon cells. Yes. And uh, I, 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 I'm curious to your reaction to that, just knowing the other work that she does in animation. 100%, 100%. And uh, that's exactly what I, what I was... Um, gesturing towards when I said that they look like a sequence. Absolutely. Um, one after the other. And there's a narrative, which we can't really say what happens in the narrative, but we can see that there's a thought that moves through and, and metamorphoses and changes through, um, from cell to cell, from picture to picture. Absolutely. Um, we're, we're coming up on the end of the hour. Do you want to just maybe a quick note about what you see some of any, you know, any of these artists doing what they're working on now, what might be coming around the corner uh, from, from any of them? I, I, I guess Kat, Katsu is not gonna tell us anything in advance, right? He's just gonna show up somewhere with, his, uh, with a drone painting something. Yeah, I mean, you never know what uh, Katsu is gonna, is gonna make. And I, what, what's very interesting to me about his work is um, this kind of dual identity as an artist and as a graffiti maker, maybe triple identity, and really as, as, a, as a computer programmer and open source enthusiast, he's, uh, he is always shares all, all, all of his code and all of his software uh, open source so anyone can use it. Um, so I'm really interested to see where he goes on all those, on all those fronts. Um, Oldenburg and Van Bruggen, I mean, Oldenburg is still alive and uh, creating, but he's, he's very elderly. And I think we're going to continue to see, you know, um, uh, works that are being made out of old maquettes and old, um, and old paintings, but I don't foresee him starting a new phase in his, uh, in his career. But Silman is really at that moment, especially after I saw what she did um, from the pandemic, where to me, it's so interesting to see painters who go back and forth between being abstract and being representational. Uh, by the way, for those of you who are in New York or are interested in visiting New York, there's a wonderful exhibition at Hauser and Wirth right now of painter Philip Gustin. And Gustin was known as, an, as this artist that went, had a lot of success as an abstract painter and then kind of threw it all away to make the paintings that we now know are his real contribution to art history that are very figurative. But at the moment, his gallerist was tearing his hair out and saying, why, why are you not painting these things that I can sell? And now you're painting these weird paintings that nobody wants. So we can see in that show um, his movement from abstract to- And, and one of your biggest fans uh, whispered in my ear that you have an opening in November in, in the Bronx. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'm working on a big, 
wall-hanging porcelain sculpture called Mom. <laughs> M-O-M? M-O-M, Mom, um, that is, uh, is a self-portrait as a, as a self-portrait of sorts of what it was like to be and is still like to be a mother uh, in the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so yeah, I'm working. Well, that is that. exciting. We will wish you b'hatzlachah with that. We hope to have Thank a reunion you. or uh, we don't know if there will be reunions or what there, what may uh, come to be, but we, we wish you the best of Thank luck with that and, and the continuity of, of your own work and interaction with all these wonderful artists that you've introduced us to. We will continue this discussion um, in, uh, with a, a future uh, works in this series. We're so excited to have you take it, taking us and showing us uh, a, a lot behind the, uh, the scenes. Uh, we haven't been able to get to all the questions, but maybe that's a good thing. You're, you've provoked us, you've inspired us, you've given us a, uh, uh, a, something to look forward to with your own uh, work called Mom, and we want to appreciate all the moms and the hard challenges that they've encountered during the pandemic. You've also um, I have a great segue to our, our, our coming webinar on Sunday, where we're going to flip back to the other side of the Atlantic, and we're going to look at Israel through the lens of filmmakers, and in particular, one now very famous animator in Israel uh, that you may have read about in the New York Times, just did a big profile on uh, the legend of destruction, and we will be doing uh, uh, a joint production with the Backstory Group here that has an intimate relationship with filmmakers in Jerusalem, animators, composers that do the great work behind the scenes to make an animated uh, feature come alive. So be with us this Sunday. It promises to be a, a fantastic opportunity to really explore the creative side of Israel as animation nation, if you want. And uh, we will continue for all of our art uh, appreciation lovers out there, more episodes like this, more ways to interact. Please share all of our episodes afterwards. We send links, we make it free to everyone. We want people to really understand this great love of art that and this value that both of our our countries hold dear, and that is bringing us new allies and new friends around the world. So everyone have a safe week, and uh, we look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks again, Gabriela. Thank you. Thank you so much. See you next time.